I'd like to talk about um, my relationship between um, technology and art and give you a brief idea why I do what I do and talk um, at great length within one hour uh, about one project which I'm particularly happy with. Um, and if there's time, give an outlook on what I plan to do in the future. Um, so, one topic which occupies me my, my whole life um, is pretty much artistic expression versus engineering. And um, I tell you a little bit about um, how I came to do what I'm doing, and afterwards you will probably understand why this bothered me so much. Um, this picture here is obviously art, so that's not a big question here. It's hanging in the museum, and we all know the, the author of it. And so, if you ask someone what this, what is this? Well, this is painting, so it's art. And this is an interesting thing for me because that's obviously a piece of engineering, and um, not many people would immediately come up with the idea to put something like this in an art gallery. Um, it's a computer. Um, but for me, if I look at those things, um, I took this photo at the Computer History Museum a few weeks ago. If I look at something like this, I'm deeply touched. Um, there's a very emotional connection to it. And to me, those things radiate beauty. And this is something which happened to me since I can think. I was fascinated by machines. And I think fascination is something which always has to do with, with beauty and with emotions, obviously. And there is machines which, where the attribute beautiful immediately comes to my mind, and there's other machines where I either don't have such an emotion or I have the emotion of that's a pretty ugly one. Um, if you just look at this, um, someone designed this user interface. Someone made a decision about the color of the switches. Someone made a decision about the shape of the knobs, about the font, about the white lines, about pretty much everything. And you notice a high sense of symmetry. Uh, <clears throat> this is, without knowing what it does, and without having any idea of the underlying structure, um, if this is a good machine engineering-wise, um, alone from the way how it looks, it radiates something. And I was always fascinated by those objects. Um, I was fascinated by those objects also because I had kind of a feeling that something in there has something to do with dedication, with um, a desire to achieve something which is very similar to artistic achievements. And I have to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I come from an engineering background, family-wise. And the idea that someone is an artist in our family was really not um, a possible career option. So, um, every kind of uh, technical exploration was highly encouraged. Um, everything else was um, pretty much um, not considered. Um, so, that's me uh, at some point um, building some machine. And what happened to me at a very early stage was that I first discovered I'm interested in art. I went to museums, I come from Munich, a quite wealthy, nice town in southern Germany, and they have a collection of really beautiful art museums. So I went there, and I noticed also that I'm very much impressed by abstract art. I like things which just are shapes of color, um, objects, I like sculpture, um, all those things. And um, at some point I discovered electronic music, just how you discover things like this um, as a boy. Um, I've been exposed to Jean-Michel Jarre by um, a uh, friend of my father. It just happened to run there whilst I was there. And for the first time in my life, I was listening to electronic sound. And <clears throat> it really changed my life. I, um, I remember every single note there. I remember the place where I heard it. I remember the, the color of the speaker this 70s brownish loudspeaker with this kind of um, um, fabric on top of it. I really see it in front of me. Um, either the speakers were really big or I was really small. <laughs> um, maybe a mixture. So my question was, 
<coughs> coming from this engineering background, how on earth um, can I combine those two? And I mean, the answer was quite obvious. Um, sound engineering would be the thing of choice. So I moved to Berlin at some point, and I studied sound engineering uh, at a film school. Um, the guy with the mohawk and the leather jacket in the middle, that's me. Um, <coughs> talking to the cameraman, trying to figure out um, where I can place my microphone without being in the picture. Um, at the same time, <coughs> I moved to Berlin in the early 1990s. This was a city um, which was one of the birthplaces of um, electronic dance music. And <coughs> I happened to be, of course, exposed to this a lot. And at the same time, I was exposed to academic computer music because I also studied um, computer science. and. Um, Berlin has a nice uh, studio for electronic music. Um, so I had lectures there about electronic music. I came across uh, a specific synthesis method which um, immediately caught my interest. Um, and I heard a piece, a four channel piece with rotating sound sources which um, deeply impressed me. And I guess we all know um, about what I'm talking here. Um, thank you, John, um, for doing all this. And um, I still can't believe that I'm here and you're sitting there. Um, so, um, I studied sound engineering um, and I made music together with this fellow here. This is a photo from, I guess, 1995. Um, a classical club situation gathered at me bringing um, boxes of gear um, in some basement and um, creating repetitive but changing sounds. And this was all considered hobby. Um, and I always had a real job, um, apart from doing this, because I was so um, <clears throat> so biased from my background that the idea of being an artist or that doing electronic music could be something where I could make a living from um, didn't really appeal to me. Um, so I worked in mastering studios, the TV mastering. Um, <clears throat> I worked later at a certain software company founded by the guy who looks at the camera, and um, <clears throat> just made what I did for myself. And it just happened that at some point those things became more and more important for me also on a professional level, that I started to earn some money with that. Um, <clears throat> what I always did, and this is probably a heritage of my um, early teenager years where I spent most of my time soldering stuff uh, instead of being social um, is that I always was fascinated by the idea of building my own tools and building my own tools just came quite naturally from my engineering background and was also encouraged by um, actually the computer music lectures I had um, at the Technical University because there, of course, there was also this idea of, well, if you want to have a specific sound, find an algorithm, program it, and see what comes out. So, the connection of building something and afterwards using it, this was my um, idea of how things could work. And so I spent a lot of time building sequences in Max MSP, I spent a lot of time building hardware controllers. And um, this is a particularly um, um, massive part of this development. This is a MIDI controller I developed for my live performances because I didn't um, feel happy with the way how people interacted with their computers on stage. And I had a clear vision of I need to build an instrument. So I wanted to be able to perform with a computer on stage like it would be an instrument. And I also like the aesthetics of some instruments I admired from the early 80s. So I wanted to have something which felt big and solid. And this is the result. It took me almost a year to build it. Um, here's another photo of it. Um, <clears throat> it was really a, a physical um, idea, a physical representation of a structural idea how I wanted to make music on stage and particularly dance music. And so this was a MIDI controller aimed for being used with live and Max and I was touring with this for 
two, no, for five years, and um, it was actually a great success, apart from the fact that it was way too heavy to carry. Um, <laughs> because I considered really every single detail when I built it, um, because some decisions you only can make once. Um, you know, I know I work with hardware, but I'm not a professional hardware person. So suddenly I had, I, I, I got a company to manufacture this front panel. Um, but of course the company can only manufacture what I told them. So at some point I had this question, if this knob here is 16 millimeters, actually, what's the square I need around it? You know, those simple questions. Because of course not 16 millimeters, because then the button would stick. But 17 millimeters, but maybe one millimeter is just too much and it may become dirty. So <clears throat> I had a lot of decisions to make um, and was just hoping that it works out. And to my great surprise, it did. Um, so that's a bit the internals. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time and dedication to build those things. Um, the engineering side, in a way. And in my whole perception of my own doing as someone who is creating stuff, I thought about two separate things. I thought about, okay, here's the engineering. And this is something I need to do to build something which I later use for the art. So a very um, two-folded model. So, okay, I make a max patch, and yes, it takes a lot of time, but at the end, it will allow me to do something which I couldn't do with something else. And when I was spending too much time doing this or programming, I felt really bad because suddenly there were a lot of doubt. Um, couldn't I simply use one of those millions of tools which are already ex existing? Um, I mean, yeah, this is cool, and people say, wow, that is really nice. Uh, how much is it? Um, but, <laughs> or where can I buy it? Um, well, it's the only one existing. Um, but what this does, I could also do with a bunch of boxes I buy, just not exactly the same way. And, um, well, so putting a lot of energy in something like this, whilst other friends of mine just create uh, fantastic music and put out successful records, um, felt like a problem. Because I felt, on one side, I like to do this. I'm, I like developing those things. Um, I'm happy if I solve problems, and there were so many problems to solve with that. And um, at the same time, I felt guilty for doing so because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I do something else. This felt pretty close to procrastination <laughs> <laughs> on a very, very high level. Um, I was also involved at the same time um, with this here. Um, I guess some of you might recognize this. This is a very, very early screenshot of Ableton Live from a pre-release version. And there my contradiction between what I'm doing for this company and my artist being became even bigger. Because there I was developing something for other people to make art with um, as a kind of a job instead of doing my own art. And um, I mean, I always had this, something said me, well, but it's pretty cool that I'm involved with this. Um, but something else told me all the time, come on, Robert focus on what you really want to do. Don't focus on building commercial products which help other people to make the art you should do yourself. Um, <clears throat> and there were even problems where I felt when I built a specific effect, um, hmm, everyone is going to use this effect now. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have time for it. Um, so um, there was a lot of doubts and a lot of um, strange feeling about what is it when I'm doing that? And <clears throat> here's another example. Uh, I built a, a Max patch um, for an installation. And I spent a lot of time with this Max patch. Um, the installation did look like this. Um, that's just a console in the middle. This one here, uh, 16 to 16 one no, which can be touched by the audience and which reacts by displaying um, information with red LEDs. And people could just walk around and do something and interact with this whole thing. So what people saw at the end was the ring of speakers. And unfortunately, the big boxes are not base bins. They're just um, <laughs> gallery things. And the speakers were really small and not very good. Um, but 
I still thought, okay, this is something I do in the background. This is the engineering part, and <coughs> that's the art. And what happened here was I spent a lot of time with the engineering, <coughs> like building the structure, etc., etc., and only a very limited amount of time with actually filling the structure with um, the, the ghost of it, the, the content, you know, more, more modern speaking. So finding sounds which work, um, find, making structural decisions which have to do with the artistic um, idea, I spent much more with the technical side, including making the next patch which looks nice. Um, <clears throat> and again, I felt this weird disconnection between coming up with nice ideas versus artistic results. And it took me till maybe four years ago, and it also had to do with my um, teaching at the University of Arts in Berlin, that I at some point decided I look at it from the wrong perspective. And it's not procrastination, and it's not two different things, but there's a strong connection between um, this engineering artist part and I decided that I need to just redefine what I am, and that's the result. I just taught myself it's okay to build machines, <laughs> and <laughs> there's nothing wrong. A lot of people do it actually, um, and um, you're not the only one. So <clears throat> I put this on my website, and I decided that whenever I talk about my art, I talk about the machines. And it's not something I put in the background and say, yeah, someone built this, but say, no, no, um, the process of building the machines is already um, the artistic work. And the result is just another part of it. And if you want to understand my art, um, you might also read what I do there, why I do it, or I explain it, or it becomes obvious in the artwork itself, if, since I find maybe a way to expose the machine, or something like that. And since I'm living according, according to this idea, I feel much more at peace with what I'm doing, and I think the results are better. Um, apart from, from this, I was thinking, what is it actually, what defines my artistic um, being? What is it I'm interested in? And I came up with the conclusion that, first of all, I'm a spectral person. I just like sound. I like um, how frequencies mix and what happens to me if um, some frequencies get more dominant than others and um, how timbres develop, develop in what, what grabbed my interest in music in the first place is not a melody. Um, melody probably comes last. Um, harmony, yes. More rhythm, yes, absolutely. But really the very first point of music is for me how does it sound and not in the way of oh this is super well engineered um, amazing how they place the, the sounds here in space but <coughs> color timbre is color <coughs> and the next thing is of course structure because well timbre without structure is not a really structure and if you put this in in a visual context which i was always fascinated in um, even if i didn't consider it as something i could do um, is shape. So sound structures, shapes, those are the the core ingredients to my artistic thinking in a way. And um, well, <clears throat> now I need to jump a little bit because I could talk for probably five, six hours about this. Um, we don't have that time. And I'd like to jump to one specific project which uh, combines uh, a lot of engineering with um, a certain amount of artistic thinking, and um, which I personally am very happy about. And this is the project which is already present here in those images. This is an installation I did last year in Nantes, in France, and it's by far the, the most, um, the biggest installation, um, the most expensive one, the one which took longest to um, actually develop. Um, and <clears throat> I'm still very happy with the results, so let's have a closer look at it. Um, <clears throat> get another photo of it. Um, it has to do with lasers. 
And there I come back to my engineering background. Um, I was fascinated by lasers pretty much as long as I'm fascinated by electronic music. Um, I used to um, be a proud owner of something like this. Um, that's a helium neon laser tube, maybe this size, um, from the 80s. And my um, stepfather brought me once one uh, back from Siemens, but it was working. And this thing here needs high voltage to operate. You can see this fancy electronics there in the background, which provides it. And um, it puts out <coughs> a red laser beam, um, which is much less bright than the cheapest laser pointer you can buy these days. Um, but hey, it's a laser. So um, <coughs> I was able to point to something, and I was able to put speakers, uh, put um, little mirrors on loudspeakers, and um, drive those loudspeakers with sine waves, and got um, interesting shapes on the wall. If the room was completely dark, and my eyes adapted to the darkness, um, because it was really very, very, very dim. And this was something I was just fascinated, but um, I couldn't make any use of this idea within my own framework of what am I interested in. It has nothing to do with music. Um, it's just this kind of technical um, thing I'd like to do because it's fun. And at some point I forgot about the laser idea and <clears throat> music became important. And this was all long forgotten. However, um, <clears throat> someday, um, maybe five years ago, suddenly this thought came in my head. I thought, hey, lasers became so much more powerful and um, so much better than what um, was possible when I was a teenager. And um, I'm interested in the visual components of my art too, and I did stuff with video, and um, I explored visual ideas, and I liked taking photos. I could do something with lasers. And um, my very first attempt was that I um, created a draft idea of what I had to do, and I talked with a few people about uh, actually making this idea become reality, and those people um, supported me in such a way that they said, oh, that's very difficult to do, forget about it. Um, and I did forget about it. But <clears throat> something happened which um, was a kind of a pivotal point there. Um, I did a concert in a small gallery in Manhattan, at, no, in Brooklyn, um, a few years ago. And those people are interested in digital art in general. And I talked with them about an idea I had with lasers. And they said, well, that sounds interesting, let's do it. And I was, at this point, really naive, um, because I haven't been working with this stuff a lot. So I thought, OK, cool, um, I do this, um, and made a concept and everything, and did a bit more serious research. Uh, I bought a laser, and <clears throat> for a lot of money, in my opinion, and it turned out to be exactly not what I want. The precision was absolutely insufficient for my ideas, and I, I got <coughs> I got this feeling that maybe what I'm going to do is actually more effort than I thought. Um, again, I need to jump a little bit. Um, after a lot of um, confusion, I met with a manufacturer of high-quality laser systems who happened to be in Berlin. And I wrote him an email and said I'm interested in, in his products. And <coughs> um, he said, hey, you are in Berlin, come by the office and let's talk. And I came to his office and felt like a little boy because I was surrounded suddenly by all these super cool machines. <laughs> and he showed me some stuff and I was um, feeling like I'm on a starship. <laughs> and because what he had to offer was um, dramatically more than what I had in mind. And suddenly I felt, oh my god, I actually could do what I like to do. And um, <clears throat> I was very naive, I had no idea how expensive the stuff is he, he's doing. And I said, yeah, cool. Uh, which one should I buy? And he just looked at me like I'm a complete idiot and said, well, you don't know what you want. Um, why don't you just come by, try a few things out? And so I talked with him about technical details. And um, then I came by and tried things out. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to give you a brief introduction how drawing with lasers actually works. Um, well, first of all, <clears throat> that's a good one here. This was exactly not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Um, I was 100% certain that this medium offers something more than those things. Um, I don't want to draw bad, bad um, 
strange um, drawings on a wall of animals moving um, whilst extremely flickering and with odd colors. Um, I wanted to do something else. Um, so, <clears throat> basically, what, how these machines work is if you want to have full color, you need um, three sources. So you need a green laser, a blue laser, and a red laser. And you combine all those into one single beam. And <clears throat> afterwards, you have two moving mirrors um, to make it possible to move the beam in a vertical and horizontal axis. And um, <clears throat> this is a purely mechanical process. And um, <clears throat> if these lasers are good, they look like this and uh, cost a fortune. And um, this is a very close up of uh, these two mirrors, which are actually used to, well, move the beam. Um, <clears throat> this is this is maybe three millimeters or something like this, or actually that's eight and that's three. And here is a very strong magnet and an electromagnet, and those mirrors can move extremely fast. And this little thing is of this size and costs something like up to twenty thousand um, dollars if it's really good. And so there's of course more to this than just this. Um, you need all kinds of driver circuits and the quality of those drivers are very essential for the outcome um, because the only way to modulate the colors is by modulating the current through the laser and it's a nonlinear process um, which is different for every single laser source. Um, there's nonlinearities involved with the drivers of those mirrors. Um, <clears throat> the stuff is extremely um, sensitive for operating temperature so you have Peltier elements on those lasers and several temperature sensors. Some laser diodes want exactly 20 degrees centigrade plus or minus 0 0.5 to operate. Um, others want it hotter or colder. Um, so a really, really good laser, which allows you to really work with it in a predictable way and not just make a nice green tunnel, um, is a lovely piece of engineering. And all these things are learned by talking to um, this laser guy, and I was able to play with those things. And um, how I did this was actually in a very similar way how I make music, because it's possible to use actually analog um, currents to, to drive all that. Um, there's even a standard for it. So 0 to 10 volts for intensity, and minus 10 volts to 10 volts for um, the angular motion of the mirrors. And you can drive this from a sound card which has um, a DC output, like my little motor, which is here on the ground. Um, so all I needed to do in order to work with the laser was taking my computer and my DSP programming skills I have from the audio world, and the knowledge about how this works, and solder the correct cable to connect my sound card to the input of the laser, and here we go. My very first result. Um, <coughs> I can't tell you how excited I was to be able to do this. I have never done this before. I arrived there, and after two hours of making myself comfortable with the technology, this was on the wall, and I felt like a, a god. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain you what, what you see here. Um, I, there's a grid here, an underlying grid, one grid and a horizontal grid, and I use uh, two random generators which create a random movement along this axis and uh, along this axis, and this movement is quantized. So there's maybe, for a period of time, there's a dot here, then suddenly it moves here, then it moves here. And every time it's standing still, um, I draw a circle by superimposing a, um, a sine cosine function um, with a certain frequency. And so I draw this semi surface. If I raise the frequency, then I draw a full circuit, and then I move somewhere else, and I got those nice shapes. And um, <clears throat> so I started experimenting, and after a few hours I was kind of confused and um, happy and didn't know what to do anymore. And the laser company guy completely left me alone. He just put the machine in the room, a room like this, um, looked at me for 10 minutes if I know what I'm doing, nodded and said, I'm in my office. And after four hours he came back, or after four hours I decided I don't know what to do anymore, I'm completely overwhelmed. So 
I went to his office and said, thank you so much. Um, I'm, uh, 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 maybe you want to have a look. And he looked at some of the um, more adventurous things I did, which were closer to this, and um, <clears throat> didn't say anything for quite a while, and afterwards said, hmm, that's interesting. I like it. <laughs> and, um, well, he was incredibly supportive, and, but he also told me that it's impossible to do something like this in the gallery in Manhattan, because um, those lasers are very strong. If you don't move the beam, so if the laser would be here, and I would simply point the beam there at full energy, um, you would have a nice hole in, the, in this uh, <laughs> Um No way to use in a small gallery in Manhattan, because laser safety wouldn't allow it. So my problem was, I was completely in this mode where I thought, yeah, this is fantastic, I want to do it, but I had no home for it. And, but I couldn't stop, there was so much momentum in this, and I felt so much that this is what I like to do, that I continued. I bought an oscilloscope to be able to work at home, because an oscilloscope basically does very similar things, as you can see here. Unfortunately, an oscilloscope is much faster, so you can do amazing things on the oscilloscope, which you can never translate to the real thing afterwards. Um, and, well, at some point I came up with structures which start to look more what I want to achieve. And I approached a few galleries and museums and said, hey, I'm this cool guy, I know, I, you, don't, you have no idea who I am, I make music, but I do this great visual work. And it's super expensive and you really need to have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm not asso associated with any gallery. Um, no, I, you know, so... It didn't work. Um, I got nice, friendly letters back. And, well, at some point, actually, someone, uh, some gallery in France showed interest um, because they did the laser work before. And um, so um, <clears throat> they invited me to come by and show what I'm doing. So I grabbed one of those lasers um, and prepared a few more things and went to this gallery, um, which is um, a huge space. Um, and I projected stuff there um, <clears throat> in the scale of the space. Um, this would be me. Um, so I just filled this whole um, really, really big space with, with those laser drawings. And as you can see already, I decided um, against color and make it white as a first step to get rid of the, the cliché. And <clears throat> they were impressed enough to say, okay, let's do it. And so I started to really, really work on it. Um, I put a lot of um, <clears throat> effort in it now because I felt, okay, this is the once in a lifetime chance. This has to be as good as possible. And whatever it needs to be good, uh, it has to be done. So um, I rented this um, big um, rehearsal space that's usually used by a dance company. So I rented this for two weeks and was working there um, <clears throat> day and night to get something done which is cool. Um, and I didn't use one laser because I noticed that the final space was so big that um, I needed three lasers, I thought. And after a little bit more discussions and back and forth, um, I decided I need four lasers. And um, <clears throat> I had more discussions with the manufacturer if he could allow me to rent out those lasers for the price of three. <laughs> which he agreed um, for some unknown reason and I was working on that and <clears throat> at this, till this time I didn't have any sound um, because basically I was so obsessed with the visual side that I thought the sound is something I do at the last minute and I was of course thinking about the sound and <clears throat> but I didn't really have a good concept and I had a lot of ideas, a lot of different ideas, um, which I all kind of, at some point, <coughs> put aside. And I left with one idea, which, um, or with two concepts, which just derived from my experiences there. The one concept was that I want to have sounds which sound like the sounds you would expect from a laser to make. That's a bit my, my film school background. You know? I thought, that, okay, let's create this hyper-reality there. There's lasers, so lasers need to sound like lasers. Of course, they make no sound. 
Um, if the scanners make a sound, then you do something really wrong and you should stop it immediately um, because you're driving them too hard. <coughs> so um, they are silent. And so I created sounds which sound like laser sounds and I created sounds which sound like sparks because um, one thing I was really, really fascinated by and which unfortunately I can't really show you on the video um, because video is the wrong medium for it. Um, so we have a maximum power of 10 watts. Not 10 watts you put in at electricity, but 10 watts um, of pure light. Um, if this one, if this bulb here has um, 100 watts and you have um, maybe 10% of what comes out as light, um, we have 10 watts, but this is uh, a circular, um, a, a not circular thing, omnidirectional source. So if you focus this on one point of one millimeter, then you have this 10 watts um, on one millimeter, and this is the power of the laser. So it's actually really bright. But you can also modulate it to be um, as dim as this LED here. And so if I work in a completely dark room with lasers which normally look like this, and the black is entirely black because there's only one beam of light, um, and suddenly it explodes into this whole 10 watts, um, it really feels like there's an electric discharge going on. And so I added sounds to, um, to this which sound like that. And <coughs> I also added some, really as a placeholder in the beginning, some granular transformations of a few piano notes. And, um, and somehow I stick with that till the very end. And um, <coughs> it just added to this kind of a seemingly film scene um, scenario of it. So at the end of these two weeks, um, I made a first public test. Because I thought, OK, um, it's, either be good, it's either good, then the public can see it, or it's not good, well, then I need to know before I go, go to Mars. So let's have some audience in here. And I invited a few friends, and I invited a few people whose opinion was important to me. And I did um, this very first yeah, semi-public screening. And it worked out extremely well. Um, people were staying. I mean, this is installation. So this is something which runs forever. It's not a concert. So um, <clears throat> I was expecting people to stay maybe for 10, 15, 20 minutes, then go out having drinks. Um, people stayed there for four or five hours till I said, hey guys, I'm really <laughs> need to close. Um, so um, I felt really that this is an achievement. And no one from the gallery from Paris, uh, from, from Nantes, was there, obviously. Um, but I didn't expect them to be there. I, I just told them that it's going to happen. Two days later, I got an email from the curator from Nantes saying, um, my, um, <coughs> my little birds told me that it's actually looking really good. So the gallery had someone there who was looking at it and kind of um, approved that it's going to be good. Um, <coughs> what I also did at this space is I recorded um, a movie um, because I needed some material for um, publicity. And recording a laser show turned out to be another task which I had to learn. Um, we tried several cameras, like normal film cameras, <coughs> and it just didn't look right. Because <coughs> unlike um, with uh, normal graphics, like from this projector, you don't have a frame rate. You just draw things at completely independent rates. Um, and it just depends on the complexity of the shape, what frame rate you get. There is no notion of frame rate. So you need to really experiment with shutter speed and everything. And you need a camera which is capable of dealing with this extreme brightness um, things. <coughs> at some point, I had a professional uh, um, director of photography and he came with his red camera which is a quite expensive film camera the digital one and we <coughs> filmed um, in a kind of laboratory situation um, this whole installation and let me show you a quick excerpt of the movie um, just to give you an impression <coughs> Do we have some? Oh, 
Well, I have it from the internal speaker. Hold on. here, and if the shadow is here, 
um, <coughs> the high frequency content gets a little bit um, um, lower, just like me passing the, the speaker here and blocking the, the tweeter. Um, so this was a kind of really nice thing to explore. And I just quickly want to give you an idea of the type of changes you see here. There are sudden changes in intensity, there's points of small intensity, there's points where it's really bright, and um, it's all quite geometric. Um, so, <clears throat> here is a photo of the setup um, in, in France, and um, what you see here, and what I already uh, kind of incorporated in my own installation when I was conceiving it is this space has all these columns and <clears throat> if you remember um, at the beginning here I had those round shapes and I had those round shapes and I liked them a lot um, but I also liked the um, the horizontal lines and the vertical lines and at some point, I had to make a decision. Um, I was very worried that my first work I do with this medium comes across as a kind of a demo reel, you know, a showcase. Oh yeah, I can do lines, and I can do circles, mm -hmm. and I can do different colors, because this is blue and yellow, right? So the, the, the white you see here is composed of blue and yellow. So of course I had and anything in between. So of course I experimented with different colors. And it's a fantastic effect if you suddenly switch off the blue or actually, much better if you suddenly switch off the yellow and this whole thing's turned into a complete monochromatic one single wavelength blue. It's beautiful, but it turned out to be something where you afterwards think, okay, and now? The moment from white to blue is fantastic, but there needs to be something else afterwards. There needs to be a justification for that. And I didn't find a reason to switch from white to blue, so I had to um, remove all this. So. A big portion of this was really reducing possibilities. And a lot of those decisions I made um, at the final space um, in France. And I like this picture because um, it shows one of the properties I really like on lasers, and which coincides nicely with my general um, perception of space. There's no boundaries. <clears throat> There's no hard boundaries. I mean, in the video here, you can clearly see, OK, that's the end. And if I have a smaller image, you still see the gray from the um, projector here. Um, you see the lasers are up here. And up here, um, the only limit is the maximum angle um, those mirrors can do. And the usual operating range is much smaller. Because the larger you get, the lower the speed is, because you have to move um, further. So you try to only use a smaller portion of, of the whole um, thing to get a really fast image. But this means that at times you can expand. And um, <clears throat> so the, the, the fact that I can draw on the ceiling, on the, on the floor, um, adds a lot to this um, magic. <clears throat> and the fact that the background is completely black. <coughs> um, <clears throat> but um, one reason why I was so much going for the vertical and horizontal lines is because I wanted to get in, um, in a kind of dialogue with all these colors. And there's something nice happening if, if you move in this gallery space. There's the black swoosh moving, and there's the columns moving. So you have a lot of vertical lines moving around um, whilst you're moving yourself. And that's kind of really beautiful. Um, that's the opening. It went super well. And um, here is a movie I did afterwards, which um, is much more tailored to um, look nice as a teaser, so um, I don't. You don't need to see the whole thing, but it gives you a nice impression about um, the nature of things there.
the video is in the others on my website, so you can do it like and watch again. Um, it's a little bit um, not smooth <coughs> during the playback, um, but of course during the installation it's completely smooth, um, which is also very important to me. This is this, um, there's a, a certain um, <coughs> I don't know. It's it's just moving in a, with a nice pace, and I worked a lot on achieving this pace. And I also worked a lot on creating those complex shapes without flickering. Um, and I'm very proud of this because I really um, felt I was working on the edges of what I can do with those machines. And so I'd like to, since you're all tech savvy, savvy people, I'd like to explain a little bit more in detail actually the synthesis of the visuals here or of the movements. Um, but before that, um, this is the, <coughs> uh, the gallery space and all these technical drawings. And <coughs> I was very happy that I did all these preparations beforehand. Um, it was the first time that I did an installation of this magnitude, so I really tried to make it good. And every single attempt of, or every single effort I put in making the documentation good and making the measure, measurements correctly and thinking about details before actually going there, Paid off. It paid off completely. Um, when I arrived, they had the rigging ready for this scenario. I just needed to hang my lasers in there and adjust it, and I could start working. And I needed the time there. I thought I'm there for 10 days, plenty of time, no problem. I was working every day nonstop. So <clears throat> this shows the vertical thing. Um, oh, there's one detail which is also important. I told you lasers are nasty things which can burn holes and stuff like that. So you have to deal with all this kind of laser safety stuff. Um, <clears throat> this is 2 meter 50 minimum distance between the audience um, height and the laser. And the reason is you don't want someone with a mobile phone doing like this and trying to hit the beam and the beam reflects on the glass into someone's eye. So you need to take care of that. There's a little fence here, and there's even a little um, light barrier which shuts off the laser completely on the hardware side, without bypassing the computer um, to make sure this doesn't happen. So that's my drawing for my industrial grade uh, light barrier. That's the light barrier there. So all those kinds of things you need to take into account when you work on something like that. Um, the final setup. Oh yeah, there's, there's one more funny detail. Um, <coughs> I, I, the, all the, the controlling of the laser movement, all four lasers, came from one single magnini um, connected to two motor ultralight interfaces. And it worked perfectly fine whenever I rehearsed it. And after two, three hours, it didn't work anymore. And um, at the very end of the project, where I tried to find a solution, I decided it doesn't work, and I need to split it into two magminis um, which means I had to completely rewrite a lot of the, the code for this just to make sure it runs again. Um, so doing it all by yourself is also something which can be very stressful. I guess next time I will have programmers helping me. Um, that's the max patch, and we'll talk about this later. There's some audio coming from live, controlled by this max patch. And that's a cheap attempt to give you an idea of what I do technically. Um, <clears throat> what I do is I create a, a cloud of random dots in memory. This is nothing visual yet, this is just memory. So every few uh, milliseconds I create a new cloud of random dots. And they are in order in a, a buffer. So as a matter of fact, if I scan through the buffer, I would get those kind of connections. So if I would simply play back the buffer containing those dots, um, which is two buffers actually, I would get a, a drawing which looks a little bit like this, static. Um, <clears throat> and afterwards, I apply a grid, like just a quantization <coughs> on the x-axis and on the y-axis. And I do apply a little bit of low-pass filtering, which um, I forgot how exactly I did, but <clears throat> which um, allows to have a much higher percentage of things happening within one grid line or one grid line there. Um, so that I mostly get vertical or horizontal lines and only occasionally I get a situation like where I'm moving from this position to this position. Um, when I drew this uh, yesterday, I thought, hmm, 
I need to look up how I did this because I have no idea anymore. And I think I thought a lot about it. Um, so the result here is basically two buffers of, of yeah, audio actually, <coughs> which are not intended to be listened to, of course. And so there is a notion of frame right here, indeed. Um, I experimented um, with, I think, a frame rate right of 20 milliseconds. So each buffer is 20 milliseconds, which gives me a nice 50 hertz um, frame rate for this whole thing. And <coughs> a bit of calculation shows that this is something like one, approximately 2,000 samples at 96k. <coughs> so I have this 2,000 to 2,000 matrix here, which allows me to do things. And <coughs> what I do is, since I wanted to have slow changes, um, I just occasionally overwrite a little bit of the buffer. So I grab a little snapshot of this and put it in here. And <coughs> I do this simultaneously in two buffers, and then I always make a cross -fade. So I change here something which would uh, visually be a hard change or something, um, but I do it in the, in the buffer which is not active, and then I make a cross -fade from the current buffer to the non-active buffer, so I get this nice thing where this folds down to this. And then I do the next step. So I do a constant crossfade between those two things. And this means I get this nicely, constantly changing shapes. And <coughs> I do this four times completely independently. And there's another buffer, um, which is for the intensity. And <coughs> the intensity is very important. Um, because this is what creates all these moving lines. Um, those buffers have the same length as those buffers, which would imply if I shut off all these processes and simply play back those three buffers completely in sync, I would get one static image, just like the, the deer or the Mickey Mouse you see in the normal laser animations. <laughs> but if I play back this buffer slightly slower, then of course the blanking is out of sync with the, the, the other information. And out of sync in my case means the lines move. And it's such a simple, simple trick, um, but extremely efficient. Um, since I'm not drawing deers <coughs> or Mickey Mouses, um, there is no sense of right or wrong. If it looks good, it looks good. So I can do things which um, people who need to draw company logos never could do. Um, I can just really take what the machine offers me and live with all that. And I can also, of course, um, change the phase relationship between those buffers. Then this whole thing falls apart. Um, it doesn't look good, I can tell you. But <laughs> if, if I apply the quantization afterwards again, then I got something which is more complex and is still quantized. So in a way, I really felt like using a modular synthesizer. I created my own visual modular synthesizer, and I could just patch things till it felt um, good. And this thing here is my big overall blanking um, circuit. And the outputs are <coughs> my audio channels which go into the lasers. And um, this is a little bit of a technical detail. Um, I wanted, <coughs> it was very important for me for this project that the technology is invisible. Because as a matter of fact, if you look at this picture here, there is nothing but light and sound. And um, there's not a single speaker in this whole space, um, but there's sound everywhere. Um, there's not a single light source, but there's light on the wall, and there's no video beamers, and there's no gray where there's black. If there's this moment where everything completely sh shuts down to black, and then there's only a few dots, it's just the same as if you look on the wall, there's LEDs on the wall, nothing else. And <clears throat> so I, I really tried to move the, the, the technical stuff out of the way. Um, I put it all on the ceiling, and this was very important to me. So that's on the ceiling. Um, that's the, the shutdown, the hardware shutdown for the lasers if someone hits the barrier. Actually, the light barrier is the only little thing which is on the ground and which is technical. I even got the technicians to um, hang the subwoofers. Um, this was quite a good discussion, um, because they are heavy, um, but it paid off. So even the subwoofers are invisible. And one thing which I changed at the very last second 
was at the beginning I had these eight speakers I, I talked about um, <clears throat> really just here on the ceiling above the projection. Um, but um, I found them too visible, even if it's just black things. But when the laser moved over them, they were, they were there. And they were also audible. You, you could walk here and you could clearly hear, yeah, it comes from here, it comes from here. Um, on the very last day, um, I <coughs> didn't make myself a friend of the technicians there because I told them we need to put all the speakers down. And um, I placed the speakers approximately here and let them point towards the wall. The wall is really hard. It's um, painted um, wood and it's painted nicely so it's a really a, a very reflective wall. And that means all the sound sources from those speakers here are reflected pretty much at the center of the wall right there where the laser is and um, so I had two things at once I didn't have direct sound anymore from speakers and I had the impression that the sound really comes out of the laser beams and the speakers were completely invisible um, this was pretty pretty nice uh, <clears throat> so this is what I did last year and um, this is actually my last slide. So the question is, should we use the last 15 minutes for an open discussion, or do we have time for a discussion afterwards, or how is it supposed to be? Um, we have another half hour. We have another half an hour. Great. Um, in this case, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I learned from that, and what I intend to do next. Um, First of all, I felt I did just touch the surface with this. I mean, that's an obvious thing. Um, it's the first time I, I played with those um, things. And I have as many um, experiences which I couldn't use within the installation, which I still feel are interesting things to explore. Um, as I said, it's really nice to switch the colors. It's nice to have this contrast between this pure white and blue and yellow and other things. But um, there was no room for it. Um, another thing which um, I didn't explore um, for this installation is all the round shapes. Um, so <clears throat> there's a lot of things which are basically off byproducts of this which demand that I do something else. Um, but there's also something which I was surprised to, to get this feedback. Um, people were immediately asking me, do you do something similar as a concert? And for me, this was a completely different um, way of thinking. Because that's insulation is meant to be eternal in some way. Um, it's not to be meant to be a performance. And I didn't even consider um, doing lasers uh, as co for concerts, because in a way, I was too afraid of that. You know, the, the image at the front here, the, the ugly ones, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which immediately point to a certain style of music, which is electronic, but far, far away from what I'm interested in. So, I didn't consider that. Um, however, um, I do now. And um, what I'm currently in a, in a planning phase is I want to do a <coughs> electronic live music performance, actually pretty much rhythmic in music. So very much on the, on the, in one way or the other, on the dance music side of things. But then again, in a very abstract way, which is so abstract that it doesn't count as normal dance music anyway. Um, where I use lasers as a visual counterpoint and where I find interesting ways to interact with um, sound and light um, in a new way and <clears throat> my, my first uh, focus was again only on the visual side I have some nice ideas um, what I like to do um, I like to draw simple shapes and a lot of them in a short repetition of time. So exactly the opposite of the installation where I felt slow movements are important. Um, for my concert, I want to achieve the opposite. I want to make use of the fact that I can actually draw really, really fast um, and turn off lasers uh, 96,000, well, 48,000 times a second um, and make use of this. And, um, I, for instance, decided I want to draw um, letters and just letters and numbers and have this flood of letters and numbers in vector <coughs> graphics. And what I noticed is 
well, if you if you start doing letters uh, as a vector graphics, well, you are suddenly um, a font designer. So this is all these interesting things which just happen when you explore uh, new territories. Suddenly you notice what kind of skills you need to do this, mm -hmm. um, which you didn't think about before. I saw, I saw myself drawing this project, it's called Lumiere. And I wanted, of course, the letters Lumiere to be displayed there too. So I was thinking, okay, an M, what's that in vector graphics? Okay, so X stays constant, I move Y, um, that's a sine wave probably. Or a par parabola. Hmm. You know, I started to find mathematical equations for letters. And I found this a really beautiful way of thinking. And so far, this is only theory because I haven't done it yet. I have tons of writings about the, the, um, the shapes that I want to draw. And <clears throat> I had a very clear idea how to do the music. And I made already prototypes of the musical side, which I found very convincing. Um, but at some point, I came to the conclusion that the way I do the, the music is actually very linear, old-fashioned. So what I do is in the preparation of the music is I work on a timeline, and I place a note here, and I place an event there, and I place an event there, and I press play and listen to it. The usual way how people these days create music and then copy, 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 and delete, delete, delete. And quite frankly, I never felt that I'm good in creating structure with such an environment. I'm always better if I have an algorithm doing it. So I decided a few weeks ago, um, whilst walking around the lake here, um, that I need to do the music with a similar principle than how I do the visuals uh, in installation. It needs to be a machine. It needs to be completely algorithmic. And all I want to do in a concert in the future is carefully or dramatically interact with this machine. And that's, of course, partly also influenced by the thoughts I have for my uh, class here, where I thought, hmm, those things all fall nicely into place. I have built machines. So shouldn't I simply use the machines to create a structure? And I just define which parts of the machines are operating at which uh, point in time. And I'm getting very excited about this. The only thing I'm really worried about uh, is I try to unfold the consequences of this. And I felt um, I'm writing a complete new audio application. Um, but I have a deadline, which is October 18th. So I'm writing a new audio application based on these ideas. I write a new visual engine on ideas I didn't explore before. And I have something like two and a half months. Um, but as usual with deadlines, uh, something will be ready at this point. Um, so that's pretty much what's in my head and um, what occupies me. And um, well, I guess at the end of the year, I know more about it. Um, so, um, well, thank you for listening. If there's time for a dialogue, I would be happy to um, open it. Yes, please. What was the algorithm behind the audio in the Mount show? Um, well, it was a Max patch, technically, written in Max MSP. And well, how did it interact with the uh, laser show? Well, it, it really interacts in... I wanted to bring an oscilloscope and show it, actually, but mm -hmm. um, I didn't find the time to prepare that. Um, you know what, maybe I can just open it. Um, let's, no, it's going to be wrong. It's going to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be wrong because the problem is if the network is not present, um, it will hang after a few seconds and I'm, I'm worried about this. Um, basically, it's really um, very similar to audio. You, if you want to draw a circuit, for instance, um, you have one oscillator creating a sine wave like this and you have a second oscillator creating a sine wave with a 90 degree phase shift and you apply one to this axis and the other one to this axis and as a result you got a circular movement so, exactly, these are new figures is the perfect example and of this course the, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is in a way all derivations from this basic principle um, does this answer your question? Or? Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. So, 
And so since you had, you know, you had this machine running and you had all of your audio outputs, did you ever think like, well, okay, I have these audio outputs, I'm just gonna throw in some traditional audio effects and see what happens. And you sort of treat it as audio and sort of step back and not worry about it doesn't do anything it just really interesting, cool. it just messes things up. Yeah. Um, but as a matter of fact, since we are talking about audio effects, I can show you one of the photos here. Um, and I explain you this in terms of audio effects. Um, this one here. So what you see here is um, <coughs> a random movement from here to here to here to here to here. <coughs> So basically, if, if you would draw a, a graph of um, a waveform for the x-axis and for the y-axis, this waveform would be stairs, like yeah, really brutal mathematical stairs. Um, this here is a low-pass filter. This is one low-pass filter on one axis and one low-pass filter on the other axis. And if you pipe in a rectangular waveform in a low-pass filter with um, a certain resonant behavior, you get these nice, um, <coughs> how do you call this? Um, overshoots. So this here is a two-dimensional overshoot of a low-pass filter. Um, if I would lower the frequency of the low-pass filter, this whole thing would turn into a morphing a blob of, uh, of a stretch of uh, curved lines. So yeah, applying actually um, low-pass filters is a nice thing to do. Yeah. Um, <coughs> If I would try to apply a um, FM modulation to this, this whole thing would start wiggling. Um, so there is possibilities, but stuff like rework or something like this just yeah. doesn't make sense. But just sort of like a, your traditional synthesis modulations, then like filters and maybe yeah, frequency and amplitude modulation and things like that. That's where it works. I mean, um, bit reduction is a perfect example because bit reduction equals um, applying a grid. Um, sample rate reduction implies applying a grid in time. Yeah. Um, playing stuff backward is a reversal of the image. Um, changing the face is a reversal. You know, there's, there is things which make sense for the visual world too. Um, and of course, if you think about the color, um, then you can really... <coughs> color is a great thing. So imagine this running, and this is a little bit blue and a little bit le less yellow. If I would apply a, an amplitude modulation to um, the output of, let's say, the, the um, blue um, laser, then depending on the frequency, I would either get nice little blue, yellow, blue, yellow segments here, or I would get a blue line moving through this yellow thing, or stuff like this. Um, so you can really think in synthesis in some ways, but. Uh, it's, as, as usual, there, there is a parallel um, or similar ideas in some contexts and in others it just doesn't work. Um, yeah, uh, Adam in the web chat room wants to know a bit more about the application with the October deadline that you just referred to earlier. Um, that's called um, Lumiere and um, it's going to um, be presented uh, at the um, Unsound Festival in Poland. And this is the first time that I say this in public, so I hope I'm not getting killed for it afterwards. Um, but I think actually I already have it somewhere on my website, so it's not that bad. Um, but I'm not sure if I wrote that in, in unsound. Oh yeah, it is already. So okay. um, yes, I'm, I need to be careful with those things because I have a tendency to say, "Yeah, I'm gonna do this," and afterwards I got phone calls. Um, that's not public yet, um, so I need to be careful. Um, yeah, Poland unsound, and I hope that afterwards it can travel. Uh, it's a bit a question of finances, um, because renting those lasers and transportation and insurance and paying a laser safety officer who does nothing but being there and saying it's okay um, <laughs> is all adding to the overall cost. Um, but um, and customs. <laughs> Um, actually, that's, that's not such a big deal because um, I mean, it's a new decane and it's a bit of paperwork, but yeah. um, it's usual business. Because right the latest and transportation. You're being broadcast, I just noticed. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if I miss something, I can, I can go back. Fantastic. You can create a feedback now and can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So, are there more questions? Yeah. Um, besides the swoosh, was there any other direct or indirect um, coupling between the sound and the visual? Yes. Um, there is parts where I um, have really literally one sample um, brightness changes to maximum brightness to get the sparkling elements and each of those um, triggers um, a low, well, is passed by a little low pass filter to get a bit of a time smear. So instead of a direct pulse, I get a kind of a, a grain. And I use this grain to drive a noise source, which is then further um, filtered to get this So that I really have a, a very hard um, sync between sparkling sounds and the visual side. Um, everything else um, is kind of informed but not in sync. Uh, I'm, in general, I'm a friend of um, a soft sync between auditive and visual elements because I noticed there's, there's two possibilities. You either are going really into extreme detail when syncing, where every little aspect of the visual side needs to have a meaningful auditive counterpart and um, the auditive side has to change a lot um, because the brain is uh, or the visual side, um, yes, you need to do a lot of effort and micro editing and create something which is actually very hard to do in real time. Um, or you decide to um, let the brain do the work and it works much better if it's really independent. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm doing those things here, those, those installations and performance of the Tariq Bari, who was also, oops, network's not there. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, <clears throat> I do these performances where uh, I do rhythmic music and Tarek is doing visuals and our sync, <laughs> our sync is very loose. We have a few points, but everything on the basis of rhythm is actually free running LFOs. And the, the sync really comes from saying, oh, slow it a little bit down, make it faster again. So it's really more about finding the face uh, on a very soft sync than hard sync. And I just noticed that this creates so much more audiovisual tension in a positive way than what you could as a sheet. Um, I tried a lot more syncing of those things at the beginning and it didn't lead to anything I liked. Yeah. Hi. Uh, when you started out, you, know, you were talking about this conflict which revolved between uh, artistic expression and engineering, and, and, and you speak very uh, enthusiastically about engineering. And, but you also mentioned when you were young, you were introduced to um, uh, abstract art. And um, you know, from my background, I sort of see an analogy, a very painterly analogy here to um, uh, geometric abstraction. You know, you really, you really have this preoccupation with shapes, you know, we're talking circles, and the grid, of course, is the foundation of so much of uh, Abex work in the United States, uh, which you know largely came out of you know Bauhaus and avant-garde experimentation in the 20s. So I was wondering if in in your visual work here, do you ever because um, you seem to be what you talk, you seem to be working intuitively, but you know there's a lot of elements in this that have art historic precedent, and I was wondering if you think about those things. Well, I mean, <clears throat> in general, um, I consider myself a, a very ill-informed person. <laughs> and very, very ignorant. So um, I <laughs> there's a lot of art I have no clue about. Um, but of course, um, I have influences and immediately think about references. Uh, one one obvious for me very obvious connection is um, basically abstract filmmaking from the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> just people using the medium film to create rhythm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. um, this is something where, which I clearly have as a reference. Yeah. Um, also because this is painting of light and it has some kind of flickering. Um, so I immediately have this mixture of high-tech versus nostalgic um, moment there. And I think the choice of this transformed piano sounds uh, is also something which in a way is rooted in this um, notion of black and white cinema. Mm -hmm. um, apart from this, um, I, um, of course, I, I looked at cubistic paintings and stuff like this. Um, 
and um, <clears throat> pretty much a lot of um, I don't I can't name the artist. It's a, a bit of a shame, but I have clearly a few pictures in my head which um, come to my head when my mind work on those. Yeah, because those are really analogies that I got out of both cinema um, and and painting uh, in this work. And you know, painting painters, you know, in the uh, that when abstraction took over became you know preoccupied with synesthesia, which is an important concept. And obviously, this is work operating in your work. And also, I don't know so much about the European sense, but the light and space movement in the United in America, particularly coming out of California in the 60s and 70s, you know, there's a lot of concerns there, and also with minimalism. That I mean, I think all these things are operating course, yeah. in your imagery. You know, I mean, it's quite clear, of course, that I, I, I like minimal music. Um, as a concept and as a result. Um, I'm a big fan of James Turrell. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> <way of thinking. laughs> um, but then again, you know, I'm also fascinated by uh, photographers like Ansel Adams. Um, and I don't think there's Ansel Adams in there. <laughs> Unless you, you, you really look very careful. <laughs> so, well, you, you know, it's probably it's probably useful that you're not burdened by too many of these associations. A lot of people get locked up if they, you know, they're, um, you know, you're thinking really about the elements that you're working with, about the life of tools and materials and everything, and, you know, you're working largely out of intu intuitiveness, and I think it's the same thing that when painters are at, operating at a high level, they're, they're doing the same, you know. But, um, I mean, also there is a lot of um, just current practice, uh, especially when it comes to working with um, high-definition video. Um, there's a whole school of, of people um, working on, on those um, boundaries between abstract electronic music and video. Um, you know, Ryoji Keda comes to my mind immediately, of course. Um, so there's a lot of strong influence on this side. Yeah. Um, but um, in a way, I try exactly to avoid um, too much of this influence, for instance, to to influence my work, because uh, I think it's a, a bit of a danger. The last thing I want to have, um, that's probably true for every artist, um, you don't want that someone is, is looking or listening to your works and say, hey, have you seen the last exhibition of you? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I really try, even if I like some of the stuff, if, if I like something very much, actually, I have a strong tendency to try to find <laughs> very different approach to the same topic because I want to avoid that people say, oh yeah, it reminds me too. Um, so I'd rather try to make a detour. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I'm certainly not feeling that. I'm not feeling like I haven't seen this. I haven't seen this particular expression of using my view. Well, it's great. Um, I hope a lot of people have the same opinion and uh, I can show it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You must be a cover of the book by Pierre Boulez on uh, uh, analogy between music, his music, especially in painting as Paul Klee. Yeah. And uh, uh, what uh, inspires me as I was looking at your uh, display is that if you let your imagination run wild, imagine that there are so many uh, things, uh, points in your display that could trigger something musical. It would uh, create a, uh, an panorama, an panorama of music, absolutely unimaginable dimensions. Well, the main point is time. <laughs> um, there's so we a, this time or uh, no, no, time not creating my, my time. I need to do this. Um, uh, there's there's so many um, anchor points in in this work, and there's so many anchor points in work I, I plan to do. Um, sometimes I'm just overwhelmed by the fact that I can do these things. Um, that's a bit of a weird position we um, computer artists are in. Um, we have this, this tool which is so, um, so boundaryless. I mean, when I look at this tool here, minus the um, technical addition, um, it's very clear what is the route to go if I want to become better has a very strong idea what I cannot do with this tool. Um, so there's a strong guideline. Um, when it comes to work within this field here, so I have a, a computer, I have a few sound cards, I have a laser, I have speakers. Um, this, is, this is way, way, way too big for, for one person. Um, 
Well, that's a huge problem. So what do you like, do with that? It seems like the minimalism is, I mean, clearly you, you have that aesthetic choice, but it almost seems like it's also a coping mechanism. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, you, you are 100% right with this. Um, that's the only way to escape this. As I said, at the beginning I had the feeling, oh my god, um, I cannot do a show reel. You know, I cannot do effect, effect, effect. Uh, despite the fact that all this stuff is lovely, I need to get rid of it. And I need to say, okay, I focus on this one thing. And I hope that afterwards, this allows me to uh, have the chance to do another thing. And I just need to live with the uh, fact that there's every time, I, every day I work on it, I create material for 10 more days. <laughs> so, um, it, will ever, it will always be overwhelming. And it will always be way beyond of what I can do. Um, it's just part of um, our artistic beings in this uh, hyper-accelerated world, um, including the acceleration of the computers. Um, they just can't create stuff, and I need to cope with the with the fact that it's possible. When I started working with stuff like Max MSP, um, I was thinking about every single audio multiplication. So it was important that I. Um, could find ways to reduce sampling rate um, and find similar ways to achieve more complex stuff by doing tricky bufferings and all this stuff to, to avoid the shortcomings. And in a way, this was a very um, relaxing environment to work in because you just say, okay, these are my limitations, I work with them. There's no limitations there anymore. That's a tough thing to, to have as an artist. Yeah. Well, um, we'll stick with this session outside. Thanks a lot, Robert.